So, right. In Matthew 5, um, I would like to look again at the uh, 43rd verse and following. But I was in a Bible study. I was participating in a Bible study, not teaching, but participating in a Bible study when uh, somebody brought up the prayers that, that we give and uh, how our attention ought to be turned on those prayers. And uh, I thought about it and realized, yeah, this is a good thought and something that ought to be, you know, shared and, and um, you know, was worth bringing forward to everybody else. And um, what we read here in Matthew 5, 43 is, uh, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I tell you, um, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So people have said for a long time, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy, meaning people have always kind of made it okay to exclude some class of persons based on some characteristic that they that they have. Um, but that's never been the teaching of Jesus, who said that a neighbor is a person whom you treat like a neighbor. So it's up to you who the neighbor is. We treat everybody that way, according to the doctrine of the Lord. He said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. The Father makes his sun rise on the evil and the good. The Father sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. So we are, as Christians, we are, you know, intended to be kind of one-sided, that we should be giving out blessings all the time, and we should be praying for people to be saved, not for them to be brought down or destroyed. And we don't take uh, pleasure in the fall of the wicked, and uh, we're not looking for those kinds of things. But something fairly straightforward about it is what he said, pray for those who persecute you. That This is a call for us to be uh, praying, and to pray in a specific way, pray for a specific thing, that sometimes there are people who uh, not only are against the um, individual or the Christian who is walking life's way, but are themselves against the Lord whom we serve, and they are trying to deter us from the path of the Lord. That's what persecution is. Um, not just somebody that I don't get along with or who doesn't like me, but somebody who really wants me to stop being a Christian, stop serving God. They want to cause that to stop. That's an enemy of the cross, of course, but it's a it's a persecution. The Lord said, pray for them. Uh, and the person who was commenting in, in, the, in that class said, why is it that in our worship services, you never hear people praying for their enemies? And you never hear people praying for the those that are persecuting the church. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting thought. I think never is probably too strong a word, but, you know, it's a good thought that the Lord said we ought to do this, and uh, so we ought to do this. You know, we finished reading in our own Bible class about, uh, you know, Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? Well, what he said is, pray for those who persecute you. Um we ought to be doing this. They don't know what they're doing. The Father in heaven makes the sun rise, and he sends the rain, both all the things that uh, people need to be able to understand that he exists, that he is good, that he is orderly, that they ought to seek him. God is always looking out for the good of the world and the good of people, that they might come to him and might become aware of him. Um we ought to be about that too. If he is our God, if we are his children, then we ought to be like him. And we ought also to be looking for the good. There's plenty of bad out there, but we ought not to focus on that. We ought to be looking for what is good and what is right. I've been talking with another brother uh, recently who uh, had relocated to a place which I would consider quite difficult. Um, but whenever I talk to him about it, he always talks about this as opportunity for growth. Uh, this could be shored up. This can go better. This could, you know, this teacher could be stronger. We need some, you know, and and then we can have some studies together and we can go over that material. And I was struck at some point, I realized that 
he refused to, um, you know, to be down about it. He refused to be discouraged by it and continued to look for what can be good, what is good and can be shored up. Where can we, um, you know, make a, a beachhead for the Lord and start doing the work there? And uh, that was a good example to me, I thought. Another uh, related idea that sometimes people are not doing right, uh, even to the point of persecuting us, but sometimes people are not doing right, and we think maybe uh, they should get some comeuppance, but uh, you don't really want that. Um, justice for everybody else and mercy for me is it's not a very good standard. If that doesn't work out. You can read Jonah to see how that turns. It doesn't go well. Um, we ought instead to be seeking to have that kind of heart that the Lord has. And then I was thinking about 1 Timothy 2, um, where you have this too. First of all, I urge prayers, supplications, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly, dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of our God and our Savior, who desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, that's very similar to what Matthew said in Matthew 5 there, beginning at verse 43. But here in 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 4, one of the first things that the church is urged is supplication, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving for all people, kings and those in high positions. So it's not just for your fellow Christians although we ought to pray for our fellow Christians, but for everybody. Maybe, you know, when you think about pray for those who persecute you in Matthew 5, very often those kinds of things are led by officials. Maybe it's the kings and those who are in authority of 1 Timothy 2, uh, 2, 2, 1 and 2, um, that you're praying for. Maybe they're the ones who are persecuting you. Um, It's good to pray for the leaders of our nation. And, uh, you know, to pray for their safety, for their well-being, for them to be strong. You you know, you want the leaders to be uh, strong, to be sound. Um, we want God to show mercy so that we might have um, the ability to continue in that life of godliness, of quietness, so that we might give thanks back to Him, so that the Word may have free course in the lives of men and women in this nation and other and abroad. You know, these are all good prayers, and sometimes you think of those people as adversarial, and maybe some of these people are adversarial, but you know, uh, Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. So we've got to reach a place, you know, of maturity, a place of selflessness, a place of maybe being above the fray to some degree to say, well, what I want is the will of the Lord to be done. However, this can be accomplished. What I want is for God's purposes to be accomplished and to be um, effective and for the church to be able to grow um, in this place. And so we pray. And uh, maybe we don't know what to pray for. Maybe we don't know uh, what that's going to be or what that's going to look like or who the messenger of such things might be. And that's all right. We still ask for the will of God to be done in mercy. We still ask for the patience of God that the word may go forth. We still ask for the blessings that people may know that he gives them and that he may have a witness and that he might turn or that they might turn to him, that they might look for him, though he's not far from each one of us. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you, says the Lord. This is the promise that if we look for him, he will be found. If we want the truth, we can have the truth. So these are things to think about. We ought to look at these when we are praying and when we are preparing to pray and think about that, that the Lord called on us to do these things, and the Lord himself did these things. From the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And that's true. If today you are not a Christian, you don't know what you're doing, you didn't know what you were doing, you didn't realize what it was to spurn the Son of God, to spurn the truth, to 
You didn't know what the cost was going to be for the choices that you were making, but the cost was a terrible cost. It was the life of the Son of God at our hands by a torturous death. And yet, the Father has seen fit to grant to us mercy through that sacrifice, to reconcile us to himself through that blood, that we might be that we might become his children by adoption through faith. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Do you believe in the resurrection from the dead? A lot of people don't. A lot of people think a leopard doesn't change his spots. But that's not what the Bible says about it. Uh, not about leopards, I understand, but about people. People change. They do change. There is such a thing as repentance. There is such a thing as a genuine change of heart, a turnaround in life that exists. We know it exists. God knows it exists. That's why he gave his son, because he knew that you could change. Tomorrow doesn't have to look like today. Today, are you a Christian but haven't lived right? Let us pray for you that you can be restored to him. If you need to obey the, the Son of God and baptism for forgiveness of sins, we stand ready to help you. There's water prepared that you might do so. If you need the prayers of the saints, please let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.